Thanks for everybody for not partying so hard yesterday that you made it um, to a Sunday morning talk. So let's see if, of course, it doesn't work anymore. Let's see if this works if I press it long. No? Huh? Okay. So I'm, um, I'm a software engineer working at Red Hat. This is how I look like on the internet. You can identify me by my nose. And I'm living up in northern Germany, which is uh, in, a, uh, in a city called Kiel. We do a lot of shipping, mostly passengers, no containers as of yet, so we're still mode one. And I work for a small startup called Red Hat. You might know this logo. Working in the Octo, which is short for Office of the CTO. We get to play with a lot of cool stuff there, make sure that things don't implode, and we help to define like the gravity of next techno no technological investments for Red Hat. And it looks dangerous, but it's actually a lot of fun. And I'm working in a group called the AI COE, which is uh, short for uh, AI Center of Excellence. And what we do is um, define the strategy or look into the strategy. Um, it's flaky. Look, it's a flake. It's a beamer flake. Maybe it's those proprietary MacBooks. I don't know. Um, and one of the things that we, so it's like threefold the strategy. First, we want to make sure that AI as a workload is running really good on Red Hat products. So we try to make sure that it runs well on OpenShift, on, on RHEL, et cetera. And one of the talks that you might have seen on Friday from Christoph, um, one of, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a team, uh, a project in our team called Project Toth. And uh, he's evaluating AI stacks and looks uh, into how they perform on the Red Hat stack so that we can give recommendations out which stacks to use, and for example, to provide optimized compiled versions of TensorFlow. So if you recompile it, um, you um, gain a little bit of extra power, and that's what uh, he's looking into. And one thing of no uh, to note, I love talks which actually give away something that you can try. So I put these small post-its on the slide with links, um, and you, where you can find out more about the projects and stuff that I'm talking about. So the next thing that we also showed off uh, here at the conference is the Open Data Hub. Um, you know data is the new gold. Data is the, new found, is the foundation for all the machine learning and AI that we're doing. And that's a project um, where you can host all your data, where you can analyze your data, and um, do the full support of your machine learning lifecycle. All components are open source. Open source, so you um, click on this link, go to Open Data Hub um, IO, I think is the URL, and you could run all the stuff that you will see in this talk, and also the stuff that you saw in the previous two talks from the AI library, like the flake de uh, um, analysis, flake detection of bugs, and the anomaly detection of logs and of metrics that I'm going to show here, it's um, part of the AI library, which is also a component of the Open Data Hub. And the third pillar for Red Hat um, is AI-powered products and services and writing intelligent applications. Actually, after this talk, there are um, two workshops from the DICON team happening in this building somewhere, and they show you hands-on yeah, hands stuff, how to uh, put something like this in place. By AI-powered uh, products, I mean um, that we try to infuse some machine learning into the products of Red Hat, and one of the products there is um, a, uh, Red Hat Insights, which tries to identify problems in your deployment, in your um, fleet of Linux machines. And instead of 
hand coding those rules, that those detected problems. We try to use machine learning to identify problems that might not surface um, um, yeah, manually, so to say. Another thing that we um, try is making more sense out of metrics. So OpenShift metrics provide a lot of signals to the operational, operational people, but trying to get some signals out of these metrics to like scale your cluster, it's becoming more and more hard because you have to have a real deep domain knowledge of these, of these metrics. And you know, metrics are just data and you gotta find some meaning in them and that's what this talk is all about. So we're looking at Prometheus. We look then at how to store the Prometheus metrics for the long term. And then we try to look at the anatomy of an anomaly. And then finally, we're gonna integrate it into your very own monitoring setup. But before, uh, a quick word of notice um, to like set expectations. You're not gonna get your shiny product and the holy grail of monitoring out of this talk. We're got not gonna show you a ready solution to turn your monitoring setup into this fancy spider demon. And we're not gonna tell a success story how we turned our messy monitoring into an advanced AI monitoring. But I'm gonna show you some tools and scripts to get you started, to get your hands dirty, to experiment with things. Some questions that you might want to ask, some, some have answers in this talk, some are not, some are not answered, and it's all open source. So let's take a step back. What is Prometheus? How many of you know what Prometheus? Is that me? How many of you know what Prometheus is? Hands, keep your hands up. Um, who played with it? Who's actually using it uh, in a production ready environment? That's good, yeah, yeah, cool. So that's the Prometheus arch architecture. To level set, I want to bring everybody to a common understanding, so let's quickly look at the... Here it's actually working, so it must be... Oh, it's on, on these monitors it works, so it might be the cable problem up there. Um, everybody loves architecture slides, right? So what's this? It's a flag, yeah. So, so it works on these monitors. It's uh, flaky. So let's break it down to the relevant parts of the, um, for this talk. So let's start simple. We have this Prometheus guy. We're in Kubernetes world, so it's got to be Greek, right? And uh, actually, this, uh, the Prometheus person um, is the one that returned fire back to the humans. Um, I think that's the reason why they have this burning torch, so a little bit of history here. And then we also have targets, and these are the things that Prometheus want to, uh, wants to monitor. Those targets expose metrics just via HTTP endpoints, and those metrics are the current state of your system, so, and that's, that's important. A target can't tell Prometheus how it looked like, like 10 minutes ago, but um, Prometheus is the one that adds the timestamp to the metrics, and the time is always now. Then Prometheus stores these metrics in its time series database, which is a really performant and an optimized um, database for this kind of data. So you can query the ta uh, time series database with a powerful query language, uh, query language called PromQL. And our metrics are nothing if you don't get notified, right? So Prometheus can store rules that will fire and trigger alerts. And it'll push these alerts to an alert manager, which will then take care of that you're being notified. So in one sentence, in its core, Prometheus is made for monitoring and alerting, and it's built around a very capable TSDB, time series database. 
So what do we really need for machine learning? Any guesses? Data, exactly. Show me your data. So we first had to tackle the problem how to store the data for long term. Because Prometheus itself is, well, you, you can configure the retention period, but it's like for six days. As we saw, it's basically for monitoring. It's not for taking the, um, or storing the metrics for long term so that you would want to, uh, that you can look like, uh, look at how your system was like half a year ago. So there's this project um, called Thanos. This is an awesome project started by one of the core developers of uh, Prometheus. And at, at one point, it'll be the canonical solution for your Prometheus, all your Prometheus storage problems. But it's uh, an early project. It's still in the making. And it's basically Prometheus at scale. So it will take the time series. Sorry? Yeah. OK. OK. So basically, Thanos takes those uh, time series database blobs, which are on disk on, in your container, take them and offload them to any object storage. And that, in effect, gives us unlimited retention. And the nice thing is that it provides the same Prometheus API on top of it. So you can query your historical data going back unlimited in time. And it'll, it'll even run the down sample, uh, some downsampling of your metrics so that you don't store those huge blobs, but you only store them at a, at a lower granular, granularity. So at that time, Thanos didn't work out for us because it was hard to set up in our environment. So we switched to InfluxDB, which works great. Um, basically, it's just two lines of uh, config in your, in your Prometheus configuration file. It's great because your data scientists will love it. It has a pandas integration, so they don't have to query the Prometheus API. They just create a data frame and um, hook it to the uh, database. But it eats a lot of RAM. And um, so if you just store like months or a yeah, couple of, couple of uh, well, all your metrics that come from Prometheus in that influx database, it easily goes up to 16 gigs of RAM, et cetera. And of course, you can create a scale out to an influx cluster, but that's uh, not possible um, with the open core model, so you would have to buy something from Influx, which is fair if you do it in the production environment, so you should support them, but um, that didn't work out for us. So we thought as a good intermediate solution, we just take the raw samples that are returned from Prometheus and store them in Ceph. So the good thing is that our open data app has support for it. That's one of the projects um, that uh, we showed you earlier. And we created a configurable con container which, would, which you can schedule on OpenShift. You configure it which metric you want to scrape and which instance of Prometheus you want to scrape. And it'll just store the JSON, blobs, uh, JSON files in object storage. The good thing is that it's also a future proof path to Thanos, because in the end, your data scientist will work with the same structure of metrics that he would get back from an API. So we're using the JSON as our, um, yeah, our API of data input. Then we use Spark to um, query these files. That's, that's great. You can easily query a massive amount of JSON files by um, Spark SQL contexts. So you just point it to a path in your object storage, and you can access it like a, like a database. It feels, actually, it feels like a database. And it has these nice distributed functions um, where you can create some statistical basics um, across all your data sets right in the Spark cluster. 
And there's a notebook with some analysis of Prometheus data using Spark up there on GitHub. And well, it's, it's a fast-paced world, so we recently <coughs> revisited um, Thanos, and we're actually ru now running it in production for OpenShift 4 metrics that we're collecting from, um, from clusters um, in the CI pipeline of OpenShift, and every OpenShift cluster that you install via try.openshift.com. And that's about 360,000 metrics that we store per hour in our Ceph object storage. And um, there's a blog post about it, how to set it up with your um, Prometheus instance. OK, now we have data, but what do we actually need? Also, what do we really need for machine learning? Yeah, consistent data. So you, you're nothing if you just have a lot of noise and a lot of data, but you actually need to understand the data that you're looking at. So let's look at the Prometheus metrics type, metric types that we have. So we have gauges, which are basically time series. We have counters. They are also basically time series, but they are monotonically increasing. And we have histograms, which are histograms, but in the Prometheus world, they are cumulative, so they are not a snapshot in time, but they are building up over the time. And we have summaries. That's another type of uh, metric, which is a snapshot of values in a time window. So if you want to know which, um, which value, which actual value you're looking at, you want to use uh, the summaries. Here we're seeing a gauge, it goes up and down, and we have a counter that goes only up, so that's easy. And that's a, so the histogram is a little bit more complicated. Both record the values into configurable buckets, but the histogram tells you how many values fall into a given bucket, and the summary reports the one actual value falling into that bucket, so that can be more precise. It's a, it's a science of its own, and you have to play a little bit with it um, until you actually understand what those metrics are. So let's get even a little bit simpler. So a metric consists of labels and a set of measurements at a given time. And it's always one value, so you can't put multiple values in, in that series. In this example, the metric name would be Cupolit, and the possible labels are like host name, operation type, and clam controller enabled. And a time series is defined by a unique combination of a metric name and its given values for the labels. So, so monitoring is, is pretty hard. Um, so one thing that you will encounter that Prometheus doesn't enforce a schema. So slash metrics can export, expose anything at a given time as it wants. So you have a service that is deployed in your environment, you monitor it, you have set up your monitoring for it, and then the service got upgraded and now it's not called Docker latency anymore, but uh, Podman latency, and you have to rewrite all your monitoring. So. You don't have any control over it, what's being exposed by the targets to Prometheus, and Prometheus also doesn't care. And then there's also the sheer amount of metrics that are exposed. So in a normal OpenShift deployment, you would have 1,000 plus metrics to look at. So I think it's a fair assessment to say that the state of the art of monitoring nowadays is dashboards and alerting. But those, creating those dashboards and alerts, you need to have the domain knowledge. And there are no actual tools available to explore the meta, meta information in those metrics, like what labels are there, how do they change over time. No, they, you have to understand those things and then set up your monitoring, your dashboards, etc. So we try to look at how can we even start by analyzing the metrics, the, 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 the metadata of those metrics, matrices. 
So here, for example, you see over the course of like five months the unique instance label <coughs> plotted. And they are stable for the first months. But then more instances start to show up, and at the end, um, there are even more coming. Or here's another way to look at these things. In the previous talks, you also saw clusters, and they're a nice uh, visualization to identify some anomalies in your metadata. Here we used a technique called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, TSNE. And you see up on the right there, there are some small blue clusters, which seem to be smaller than the others. So it's, it would, would be interesting to look at, at these, whether why the um, label here changed. And there's a notebook available on GitHub that can produce these clusters for you. Just point them at your Prometheus values, metrics, and off you go. Which brings us to the most uh, interesting part. That's so finding anomalies in time series. And so let's define first what an anomaly is, what, an, what anomaly types we can encounter. So for that, we need to look at the possible components of a time series. So it can have a trend, that is the series increasing or decreasing over time. And if those trends have small inner trends, and they fluctuate in intervals, but like regularly, regularly, then we call this a seasonality. So maybe your cluster is more active during the day than during the night hours. And an anomaly would be like any behavior that doesn't adhere to the trend, the seasonality, or, or the overall forecasted values. So here we're see, uh, seeing two seasonal anomalies because the values just don't cycle as expected. And we also see a point-wise anomaly, that's where, where a hard spike is in these values. And one neat library that we've been tooling with is this um, profit library from Facebook. Here you see a graph of the list image operation um, in your OpenShift cluster. The black dots are the actual monitored values. And the part without the dots is the prediction of the, of the future. So you can quite nice see the upper and lower bounds, what it predicted. The upper image shows the extracted trend of the values, and the lower one shows the extracted seasonality. So these graphs are right produced from that profit library. And there's, again, a notebook on GitHub, which you can point to your Prometheus metrics you select the metric, and it will create such a nice graph. But basically, you don't want to be alerted when something goes wrong, right? You want to be alerted if something actually is wrong. So the accumulator tries to um, detect anomalies or tries to alert you if there's a constant flow of anomalies. So rather than detecting, de detecting anomalies point-wise, we have a running counter that increases over time, and when an anomaly is not there, then it decreases again. And once that counter is above a certain threshold, then we'll alert you and identify this as a real anomaly. So instead of just giving you an alert if there's a spike, we will give you an alert if there are multiple spikes in a small window. So let's look at the architecture set up so far. So we have our application running on OpenShift. No? There, there are some problems with the synchronization. Oh. The, the, the box. My, my box? Probably. Okay. Then I just hit my box. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we fix things in the office of the CTO. Just give it a kick and off you go. Sometimes it helps. 
So we have Red Hat OpenShift running, we have our application deployed, then we have Prometheus deployed, Prometheus sends data to Ceph. Nowadays I would have to put Thanos in, in also in that uh, image, so, but it still stores the data in Ceph. Then we have Jupyter running, where we have our notebooks, where we do some experimentation, and we have Spark running, where we scale out our experimentation. Well, it's just research, so you just looking at these things, but you cannot actually do something with it uh, if you're the operations kind of person. So we wanted to make it really easy for you to experiment with it. And what's easier nowadays than just give you a container that you throw into your environment and off you go. So that's our architecture. We have Prometheus, which, so that's, that's the, where we get the data from. I could turn this one around. Yeah. Just take pictures of that with your mobile phone and look at the um, one as long as it's there. <laughs> so the thing that you um, get from us is the, the um, red box where those models are in there. There's a, there's a profit in there. That we have um, Fourier analysis. Those models are being trained on a constant basis. We store the forecasted value into, um, into an attached storage. Then we read those forecasted values and via Prometheus exporter library, we let the same Prometheus that you use for monitoring scrape that container again so that you have your forecasted values and your actual values in the same Prometheus instance. It's up on GitHub. You can try it locally, build the container, or run it on OpenShift. So we have build configs there to get you started. It's easy to configure. You just give it one metric name to forecast, and it will report the upper and lower bounds that we saw earlier back to Prometheus, and also if it found an anomaly. So if it, there's the accumulator built in, so you get a one if an anomaly is there, when it thinks an anomaly is there, and it will report zero if there's no anomaly. So pretty straightforward for somebody who's familiar with Kubernetes, it's I think five minutes to set up. You can set up your alerting rules. So if the metric is out of bounds, we're gonna set out, send out an alert. And everybody loves demos, so I've provided something here for you. If that works. Yeah, it works. So I try to not click on these things because uh, I also have problems with the Wi-Fi. But basically here it is. So that's um, our training pod deployed in the, in the cube system. So that's just one container running there. It exports the metrics that we see, that we saw earlier. So here we're exporting the predicted load one for one node um, from the profits tooling. And here we're seeing it. And here we're seeing it for the Fourier analysis model. Oops. And here's a nice Grafana dashboard. So the red line is the actual load of the node. That's, that's um, drawn against the profit model we nicely see the upper and lower bounds that are predicted and the extracted strand. And you also see that these bounds change at a certain time. And that is because we need to retrain our model every so often. So it's not an online model which is constantly retrained, but you can, figure, can configure the uh, container to uh, like a 
time window that it looks back to retrain the uh, model or to retrain the model on which, on which period or frequency it would retrain it. And also you can configure it at how much time it will look back into the, into the past. So this is configured to retrain on an hourly basis. The other model that's in there is uh, Fourier analysis, which works better than to predicting the actual values of a time series. You see that profit only, at least there, can give you like a trend and the upper and lower bounds that it, uh, the metric should be in. And Fourier does a good job at predicting the actual outcome. So the red line, again, is the one that's the actual one, and the blue one is uh, the predicted line. And it matches up quite OK. So here, I tried to produce an anomaly by putting more load on the cluster, which was, unfortunately, not found by profit as an anomaly. So in the previous um, test, it worked out, but uh, here it didn't. But at least Fourier found an anomaly at that point, and also at these points. And that's where you probably want to play with it, fine-tune one of these models, select another, select another metrics that you want to look at, etc. cetera. So it's, it's nothing that works out of the box and will give you some more insights, but it's easy to play with. It's just Python code out there. You install it, you tweak it a little bit, play with the dots, and you get an actual um, feedback. And that's what also Steph mentioned in the previous talk. So I think that's really important to get out of this, I have some data set somewhere and I have a notebook doing some experimentation, but I actually want to hook it up to my live data and um, see if I can make any value out of it. So I would suggest that you take one simple metric. For example, you, if, if you monitor the, the, um, the amount of storage that is being consumed. You try to predict the trend and see if there are some spikes there. And let it run for some time and play with it. Yeah, so let's go back to the presentation to wrap up. It's not a perfect tool, but you can use it right in your production environment. And it does the basic things to be honest, it does the basic things that all the AI ops tools from commercial vendors give you. Because they are also just predicting the future. They can detect anomalies. And that's basically it. They have a lot a bit better integration, for sure. And uh, they might have more pre-trained models out there. But it's not something that you point at your environment and does magical things. So you first have to have your monitoring straight and if you reach that level, you can apply some machine learning and AI techniques to it. And it's a framework that gets you, that gets you started. It's integrated into OpenShift. It will run perfectly on the data hub. Some of the parts for, um, are integrated into the AI library. So if you're not doing it with Prometheus metrics, you can use it, uh, you could use it there. Um, the AI library is a part of the Open Data Hub, so there are tools out there. And here is the collection of all those stickers, so you wouldn't have to need all photos uh, during the talk, but I didn't want to spoil it for you. If it shows up again. So, now. <laughs> okay, that's it. Questions? I think it's, it's, uh, it's all, so the question was whether we have a position on whether it's an ensemble of models or it's one model or is Fourier be better than profit or how long we look back in time, et cetera. I think it's still in the experimentation phase. So you would, 
need to apply it to a metric that you, pers uh, you, that you understand really good, and you try to find some anomalies in that, and then try out some of the models there. So as you saw, Fourier is really good at predicting the actual values that go up and down, whereas um, profit is better at predicting some upper and lower bounds. So depending on the, on the nature of your metric that you want to analyze, you want to find some of the models there um, that are applicable to it. And I think there's a vast amount of models that still need to be explored. So we just tried two out there. And um, now we're working with the OpenShift 4 team to predict whether the uh, rollout of a cluster 4, of a version 4 cluster is going well. And that's an actual use case. So we will try some of the models out there and then choose the one that's best suited for that problem domain. I think there's no one size fits all method. And even for, um, for the proprietary vendors, they have like four models to choose from and they also say in their documentation, try out some of the parameters and use what's good for you. Is there any mechanism to, for like a human operator that's interacting with these systems to provide feedback and improve the model by saying this was an anomaly? So the question was if there's a human factor feedback loop to tell whether an anomaly is actually an anomaly or not. In this setup, no. So we just retrain the model and hope that uh, anomalies are detected. As you saw, I can't even produce anomalies uh, in, a, in a reliable way. Um, for anomaly detection in logs, we are working on a feedback loop. So there we also run into exactly the same problem that we find a lot of anomalies. Some of them are anomalies and some of them are pretty fine. And uh, some of the, so that's, that's the next um, step that we built in there. Um, and Selden actually has, so Selden is a model serving tool, which is also part of Kubeflow. Um, they have a feedback API where you can give a feedback to your prediction. So that's probably something that we explore there. So that's a really valid point. I'm not sure how to set, up, set this up in a Grafana environment because as I, as I know there's no feedback mechanism in Grafana where you could um, say, okay, now send something to this request in relation to this point in time or something. No? So, please try it out. No? One more. Uh, have you tried to use uh, timescale DB report rest for all the sample from the data? Or have you seen space in the ambiguous? No, we didn't use PostgreSQL um, because Influx was so much easier to set up, to be honest. And the other one was so the question was whether we used, tried to use PostgreSQL or time series. Yeah. Ah, okay. So whether we use TimescaleDB, which is a plugin for PostgreSQL to um, support time series data, no, we haven't tried that. I. I Yeah. That there are some uh, spikes, but if you enable the emails so that uh, the uh, actual users get them and would complete the uh, loop. I don't uh, know what DMS, enabling DMS is. No, enabling the emails. 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 So, no, 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 we didn't enable. So, the question was whether we are wanted to be spammed by emails from our. Uh, proof of concept setup. No, we didn't enable emails uh, because we already receive a lot of emails. <laughs> okay, then thanks. Thank you. Have a good time. <laughs>